Welcome to the Golden Age of Cardboard podcast, where we remember a time when stacks of cards were held together with rubber bands and Mickey Mantles were put in bike spokes. We hope you will enjoy and reminisce as you come along with us as we tell stories about the baseball cards from the Golden Age of Baseball. We will examine the state of the vintage baseball card market and talk to some of the greatest collectors in the hobby. You won't be hearing us talk about any chrome or shiny cards here. Now, to take you on this retrospective journey, here's your host, direct from the shallow end of the gene pool, my son, Mike Moynihan. Yo, and hello, everybody. Mike Moynihan here, Golden Age of Cardboard podcast. And we're into February pretty good. We've got pitchers and catchers reporting. We're going to get some boots on the ground in Arizona telling us about spring training in just a second. But first, I just want to uh, just tell everybody, again, thanks for continuing to support the podcast. Uh, really appreciate it. And we're running through this series of looking at all the Bowman sets, 1948, 1955. We're skipping around. And... I think that kind of is fun. I mean, if we went in order, it'd be a little, little more boring. But this is, uh, this is good. So this week, we are gonna do a set that I love. That I actually don't have a ton of cards for, but always looking to add more. And and I'll tell talk about why I think that is during the episode. But I'm gonna bring on my good friend. He is a regular on this program, number one in your hearts, in your minds, George. Diamond Yard Sports Cards, welcome to the show again. Thanks for having me on, Mike. I've been looking forward to this uh, for quite a while since you mentioned it to me. And uh, so this should be a lot of fun. Well, I want to read through. We're doing 1950 Bowman. If you're watching the podcast, you can see George's shirt, one of his favorite cards of all time. He is wearing the 1950 Jackie Robinson, Bowman Jackie Robinson. And so... I want to talk through uh, the, I'm going to give a quick description of the set I kind of enjoy doing this. Cause I always learn something as I read through this. Uh, ushering and, in the, Oh, go ahead. And before you do, the shirt is courtesy of Rick vintage oddball card. So shout out to Rick. Thank you. I have a 1934 Gaudi Lou Gehrig as my shirt from Rick. He's, he's good at giving us shirts of our favorite cards. He's very thoughtful like that. Um, so, hey, put down below if you want a shirt from right now. <laughs> Rick just prints shirt for everybody. No. Yeah, it's uh, a screen printing business, right? Right. So let's talk about 1950 Bowman. Ushering in the new decade of cardboard, 1950 Bowman baseball brought the storied card line into full glorious color. And while the set might not have many, any top tier rookies, that shouldn't take away from its attractive design and a solid crop of early year cards for several Hall of Famers. The 1950 Bowman baseball checklist has 252 cards, which is up slightly from 240 in 1949. The set is home to some early cards of both Jackie Robinson and Yogi Berra, who are among the most popular and valuable cards in the set. Other notable players include Ted Williams, Warren Spahn, Bob Feller, Roy Campanella, Pee Wee Reese, and Duke Snyder. The key rookie cards in 1950 Bowman baseball are Don Newcomb and Hank Bauer. Because he's the first card in the set, Mel Parnell can also command strong values. Often left on the top of a rubber band bound stack, the card took the brunt of the damage at a time when condition and collectability weren't considerations. As collectors can see, 1950 Bowman continued to evolve, to evolve as far as design goes. While 1948 Bowman baseball offered plain black and white photos, that moved to colorized photos the following year. And yes, they did have some color, but it's limited. 1950 Bowman opts for paintings instead of photos, but the trade-off is full color. The paintings are based on photos, which go for a realistic approach. Cards are smaller than what's standard today. They only measured two and one sixteenth by two and a half inches. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, the card backs make good use by filling most of the space with a player bio and some basic info. For cards number 181 and number 252, there are versions without the copyright info on the back. Considering the age 1950 Bowman isn't overly expensive, 
The lack of major rookie cards helped. That would change for 1951 Bowman, which is a week and you know a couple weeks it'll be out there. We'll do 1951 Bowman, which of course has the Mickey Mantle and Willie Mays rookies. So that's a quick overview of the set 1950 Bowman. George, what do you love about it so much? Why is it so near and dear to you? Well, when I get back into the hobby in 2005, um, you know, I had I I had started to look for the Jackie Robinson because at that point. I felt like I could get into it and it was still reasonable back then. I mean, literally like $200. And so that card was a card I always wanted to get when I was younger. And I always felt like, man, that's just a card I'll never be able to own. But time passed and then I picked up that card. Well, I, st I started to look at all the Bowmans then again. Uh, I had looked at them when I was a kid, but not to the extent that I started looking at them beginning in about 2005. And, you know, like you said in the, the summation, um, the, the colors, I mean, the colors are so vibrant. And when I think about the set, um, I think about, I had this written down, uh, notable visuals of cards, old borrow parks, girders, beams, stands, and finishes. So everybody seems to be finishing their swing or finishing throwing through the wall. And it really has a lot of great action shots. Um, the backgrounds are fantastic. And the artist renditions are just Excellent. Now I have some stuff I'll share a little bit later on um, about where these pictures come from to some degree, but it was to me it was the artwork uh, that really carried the day. It wasn't uh, the rookie cards. It, I mean the Jackie card's a big card. There's a lot of big cards in the, in the set, but it's also a very reasonable set for collectors in this era. I mean when you think about buying an, an early 1950s set or working on an early 1950s set, these are reasonable cards because there aren't these monsters in it that some of the other, you know, 51 Bowman has those monsters in it. Um, 49 with the satchel and the Jackie, um, among other cards, uh, those are monsters as well. But the, the reason I, I gravitate to the set is just the beautiful color pictures and Bowman was on top. Bowman had no competition in 1950. They were king of the hill. Yeah, I find that interesting. And I always think I try to think about what's going on at Bowman late 40s, you know, 50 into 51 when they are king of the hill. I mean, they go from the 48 set, which is very basic, the 49 Bowman, they start adding a little color, I think, as a kind of answer to 49 leaf. OK, um, they start adding color. In fact, as Dave and I talked about last week. You you saw even more colors in the second series of the 49 Bowman. In the 40 in the first series, it's reds and uh can't remember the other color. I'm going totally blank. Um, but it was like a two-color system. Then they start adding all the pastels and adding names and things that oh crud, 49 Leaf has all this cool stuff. We better in subsequent releases series within 49. Then I don't know if 40 by the time they're planning and, and getting ready to release 50 Bowman is leaf still in the picture that they might continue to release cards. So yes, they didn't have a lot of direct tops. Wasn't on the scene yet. They didn't have a lot of direct competition, but I think the reason we get these colorized photographs in 1950 Bowman is they're like, we better continue to, you know, build our game or else, Somebody else is going to come in and sure enough, tops, you know, sort of in 51 and then full full bore with Cy Berger in 52. So they're, they're <laughs> it, it wasn't long that they were on top, right? And so. Yeah, it was short. To prepare for this, I kind of looked through um, old price guides to kind of get an idea about uh, what cards were used to be looked at as big cards in that 50 Bowman set and has that changed over time? And, uh, you know, I'm looking through the, the Bowman, the, you remember this one, Mike, one of your favorites, it's the what's it worth 1983 baseball cards. And so the what's it worth, I was my Bible when I was uh, about 11 years old. And this thing has Bowman at the very front and it's very minimal. Uh, the amount of pages that Bowman gets, you know, cause they were minimal sets. And to me, I just kind of blew it off back then when I was real young because I wanted to get the top stuff. I wanted to get the new stuff. And to me, vintage then was, you know, vintage was 60 stuff. Um, but but Bowman was flying under the radar. And I, I don't think they the world they didn't light the world on fire with the 48 Bowman set. And a lot of people still to this day are not fond of it, um, even though it does have some very key rookie cards. Um, if you're any kind of collector in the hobby, you know, it's it's hard to say, you know, 
I don't want to. I don't want a forty-eight Bowman Stan Musial. I don't want a forty-eight Bowman Yogi Berra. Those are key cards. Uh, they're just black and white, and people don't like them. And like you and Dave were discussing, Bowman starts to realize the heat that Leaf is putting on him, and you can see, like in the later, like with the Satchel Page that you picked up, um, it has that beautiful marine green background to it. And then the, the Larry Doby has this beautiful, if you get a nice one, it's got a nice yellow mustard yellow background with pops this Clevelandians had, which is red. Um, but yeah, they were trying to do something different here with 50 Bowman. Um, and I think they they accomplished it uh, in a lot of ways, uh, just going through these, these beautiful cards. So it mentioned not a lot of rookie cards. Don Newcomb, borderline hall of famer i mean he's not a hall of famer i i don't think he'll ever get in he's not one of those guys that just screamed hall of fame certainly a very good player the dodgers with campanella and robinson and and newcomb were you know kind of trend setting in terms of having black athletes on their team and uh so it's certainly a popular card an important card the don newcomb rookie for what he meant to baseball but not not huge hall of fame rookies in there none at all actually but some really critical cards in terms of beauty for some major superstars within baseball during that time. Um, the first card I really want to talk about, and I've got a few here, uh, is the Yogi Berra. Uh, because I just think it's such a cool card, the image there with him squatting. He's got the catcher's gear on. He's, you know, a little pose shot with his mask on the ground. I think it's just a, a really cool image. It's kind of, you know, it's 48 Bowman. He's what swinging, I think. And it's like a little headshot of him swinging the bat. Uh, 49 Bowman's very similar to that. This is kind of the first picture of your card of Yogi Berra catching. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. I just love I it. I, it's a great, it's a wonderful card. I, I think something was dawning on me when you're talking about this and all the Hall of Famers and the lack of key rookie cards. And again, Don Newcomb is a very important card, very important player. Um, but at the same time, it reminded me of the 86 Tops set when I was growing up. Right. How it was loaded with Hall of Famers, loaded. But there were really no, I mean, you know, long, long, uh, on the long haul, you know, the, the Ozzie Guillen and the Vince Coleman are not, you know, rookies. But the only reason I'm bringing that up is that this 50 Bowman set and Yogi is part of this. There's so many great Hall of Famers. And I would venture to say they have it contains some of their absolute best cards. That Yogi Berra to me is his best card. And there are multiple Hall of Famers in this set who have, in my opinion, their best cards. Now is that a fact? No. But I mean that like you said, that Yogi, that is a classic Yogi pose, right? You think Yogi Berra the catcher. Yeah. That's it to me. Yeah, and I mean, let's not confuse lack of rookie cards for lack of star power. There were 27 Hall of Famers pictured in the 1950 Bowman set. And so it's not like it it didn't have star power. Um, the only, well, that's a, that's a whole issue for another time. I was going to talk about how I hate that 51 Bowman is basically a clone of the 50 Bowman Uh Little bit yeah, we, we talked about that on the uh, uh with Don and, and you on the, the fabulous 50s that we did, but yeah, that certainly can be something that can be addressed, you know, at, at the 51 Bowman broadcast. You do, but boy, yeah, this is this this set again to me, it comes out at you. These are pictures that have not been recycled. Well, they have been recycled to some degree, and again, I'll show you some pictures here in a little while that are used in 49 photo packs. And they are the same pictures, Dodgers specifically, that were used on the 50 Bowman cards. Um, so they're not the first time that fans saw these pictures of these certain players. Um, but the, the the Bowman, it just came at you with these wonderful uh, cards and, and, and all-time Hall of Famers. And here's one like the Yogi, if you don't mind me just taking this a little bit. Yeah, is go. this Bob? Bob <laughs> I'll just put it down. Bob Feller. You know, I mean, is, is this like the quintessential, like I think of the natural. Like this is like a Norman Rockwell painting, like the Yogi. It's so beautiful, this 50 Bowman feller. And he's just winding up like he's going to do, like he, he like he's done before. He's going to do for 10 years after this or six years after this. And he's just a legend. He's one of the biggest players in the game at that time. He's warming up before the game in the background with the stands. 
Um, and I just think that this is a fantastic card, like the Yogi. And again, I think it's his best card. Yeah. And I think there are some letdowns, I would say, within the set. Uh, the Campy is not exactly something that, you know, it's a it's a basic headshot portrait. Uh -huh. uh, that looks like a, um, I guess, a photo pack type card, like you're saying. Well, this is a photo pack, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Go ahead. So this 50 Campy um, is an exact, is a paint painting of the Dodgers 1949 photo pack Campanella, which I have some glare, but there it is. This is the photo pack Roy Campanella that came out in 1949. I guess you could call this a rookie photo pack. Um, and so at the stadium, they would hand these out. The photo pack I have is from July of 1949. And I got the Campy and the Jackie graded. The Jackie is not the same in that photo pack, the 49 photo pack, as the 50 Bowman. But um, this is the same picture. And similarly, uh, I guess I'll just do this now uh, since we have this. This is Pee Wee Reese 49 photo pack. And the Pee Wee, take a look at the card. It's kind of hard to see. There you go. It's the same. So in 49, the Dodger fans received this at the ballpark. And in 1950, when they opened packs of baseball cards for 50 Bowman, they got that. Don Newcomb, the rookie Don Newcomb, right? This is yeah. a 49 Newcomb and just looks is the same image that the painter um, adapted for the 50 Bowman card. And I'll just give you one more. Gil Hodges, recent Hall of Famer, same picture. Now, I noticed, though, on some of these pictures that artist makes in the painting, makes their faces a little bit wider. Like I noticed uh, Hodges and Ralph Branca, they made their faces a little bit wider and Carl Ferrillo. But again, the same thing, Ferrillo, Branca and Ferrillo. There's Ferrillo, there's Branca, same picture as in the 50 Bowman set. Ironically though, for you, and I know you got one of these from Dave, uh, 49 Duke Snyder. You recognize this, fo this photo? Yep. That's the 49 Duke Snyder. Um, that you own the Bowman or the, the, the 49 Bowman rookie. You're right. uh, and it's in the 49 photo pack, but it's not his first photo pack. It's, but it's not used in the 50 Bowman card because it was always already used by Bowman in 49. And anyway, <laughs> so, so these are just adapted from these different photos and these paintings, but you're right. That Campanella, I mean, it's not bad, but it's not as inspiring. I think as the Yogi, uh, as a, as a baseball card. In terms of picking these up, when people are looking for these, I think <coughs> obviously centering is an issue, but I, I think on this set, it's not as big of an issue because the border is so thin already around it that a card can still look great and still be off center. I mean, my campy is off center, but it doesn't look terrible. Um, I mean, it is a six, so, <laughs> you know. There's a reason, I guess, other reasons. I guess the centering brings it to a six, but uh, but even my Barra, you know, is kind of off-center, but it still looks great, even though it's a little bit off-center. I think you, I think it, it gets away with it a little bit better, if that makes any sense. Well, and I think part of that, Mike, I think you're right, and I think part of that is that the picture, the, the paintings are so, they pop so much. They're so outstanding. And, you know, it, it, the backgrounds, too, the backgrounds – like the way people draw or paint is the foreground is more clear and has more definition. In the background, it gets a little bit more blurry. These backgrounds are, I was looking at a lot of them. They're, they're not blurry. They're very, very detailed. You know, when you look at the feller and you look at the other, I mean, you can look and see these guys with their fedoras on in the stands. And there's a, a bunch of different cards like this. Um, but there's just so much detail to the backgrounds of these cards that I think your eyes are just drawn to the, to the, the painting and kind of away from centering, like you might normally look at a regular 60s, 70s baseball card and think, oh, the centering's off. Um, because this is all picture. There's not even a name on it, like you and Dave discussed in 49 Bowman. Right. Um, with the, they, what they put, start putting the names on later in the series. Yeah, I think, uh, I don't think they needed names. I think names would have distracted from it. And we see that in 51, right? They do put names essentially on the same pictures. And I don't know that it adds a lot to the card, honestly. Oh, I agree. I think in 51 Bowman hurts it because a lot of these names are in a, they're in a black rectangle. 
Right. And so that white name and then black has so much, so diff, so much difficulty with the print and the print dots and the smudging. And you have so many roller marks on those. It's ironic too. Like there's so many roller marks on 51 Bowman, but on 50 Bowman, there aren't many roller marks. It's right. just, I don't see many who have, that have roller marks, which is kind of odd to me. Another quirky thing that I really love about 50 Bowman is it includes some managers and coaches. And I think, you know, trying to fill out the set, uh, trying to make it a little bit bigger, make it have a few more cards. You get cards of Casey Stengel, Leo DeRocher. Uh, Frankie Frisch has a card in 50 Bowman, who is a coach for, I think, the Cubs back in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, you have... I just think that's a cool kind of addition uh, to the 50 Bowman set that you kind of don't have in other years. And from what my research indicates, they were the first to do these manager cards. Yeah. The first to issue them. And frankly, it's funny, the Stengel, I was looking in the, in the what's it worth guide from 1983 and the Stengel card was really uh, kind of, a, it was a top 10 card. It wow. was, it was more expensive than the Newcomb, the Dobie, um it was it was a top 10 card it was more expensive than the duke rizzuto spawn that is shocking you know how over time it, people don't seem to uh, maybe it's just how things have looked but you know maybe they don't respect the genius of casey stengel as much or maybe they just attribute his success to some of his great players that he had but it was surprising because i'm like this card is not a card that is tremendously sought after by collectors today uh, it's certainly not a top like six card in the set but right. in 1983, according to their price guide, it was. Yeah, I, I've as I've been searching for these cards to build the Hall of Fame run, uh, surprisingly, they're not as cheap as I had kind of hoped they would be, honestly. Even the Stengel, the Frisch, I mean, to get a decent grade, three, four, five-ish grade, you're going to pay 50 to to $100 for those cards. And that just surprises me. Uh, maybe it shouldn't because it is such a, a early set. And I don't know. It just has always surprised me. That's why I have so few of them. Cause I'm like, Oh, I have a hard time stomaching paying that much for, mm -hmm. you know, Frankie Frisch or, or Casey Stengel or Leo DeRocher or whatever. Yeah, It's a sneaky, it can be sneaky uh, expensive to some degree. I mean, it's still again, a lot more affordable than 49 or 51. I um, mean, you know, and you start, I mean, the Jackie is the biggest card now. Uh, back in 1983, the Ted Williams is the biggest card. In 19, I have a Beckett here from 1998 uh, with McGuire on the front, Dr. Beckett, 1998. And this Jackie was number two then as well. Uh, Ted was the big card. Now, things have certainly changed, but that even the Yogi, though, you, you look for, I've been trying to buy a Yogi now for a long time. And I just, you know, I want to find the right one. And at the same time, I want to find the right price. And I mean, my local card shop has one that's going to grade a PSA three and they have $425 on it and they won't move. And I'm like, <laughs> this is not a P you're charging me PSA 4.5 money on this anyway. So, you know, even, you know, you're, you're going to end up in the hundreds of dollars, especially on the, you know, the, the guys now who are, you know, the Campanellas and the Yogis and the Rizzuto. And speaking of a card in the set, man, Again, Phil Rizzuto. That's the best looking Phil Rizzuto card, in my opinion, that was ever issued. And it's just awesome. It's a fantastic card. Is that the one where he's jumping up and going to catch a ball? And yeah. Yeah. And you got the girders and the beams, <laughs> and then the stadium in the background. It's fantastic. Um, yeah. That's just, the, the, you know, there's a series of them. The Doby is probably his best card to me. Um, he's maybe that, getting ready to swing at a pitch or something. Yeah. Here's a Doby that I have. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's, you know, 51 will be the same, but just to look in the background there, it's almost like you just, you're jumping into like the natural, you're jumping into a movie like that. It's like, man, I'm, I feel like I'm just like sitting there, you know, watching him hit and I'm, I'm on the, uh, the third base side, you know, it just, the visuals on these cars are just, blow, they blow my mind. They really do. And the more you go into it um, and go look at the, all these different cards, the more you see, wow, this is just Amazing, amazing artwork adaptions of the photos. Well, let's talk quickly about the two big boys in this set. You've got Jackie and Ted, right? And let's talk about the Ted first, because it's the 
like you said, for a long time, the biggest card in the set. Now the, the second biggest card in the set. Um, at this point, Ted Williams is a bona fide stud, right? Uh, do you have yours? Do you have one? I do not have one. I have a 51 and I've been working on getting a 50 for a while. And again, you know, it's people, it's just, it's, it's a great card. And, and it's like, I, I want to get the right one, but man, it's, it's not cheap. It's not. What do you have? What's your grade on yours, Mike? Uh, three Nothing. and a half. Three and a half. Yeah. Not so, cheap. and it's great. Uh, but I bought it years ago before it was as expensive as it, as it is today. Mm -hmm. um, and again, glad I did still expensive at the time for sure. But I wanted it. Uh, how many, how many Jackies do you have at this point? 50 Romans. I thought we were talking about Ted. Well, what else do you want to talk about Ted? You don't even have one. So no, I, I, but I, I have a 51. I, I was just going to say, I don't know if it's his best looking card, but it's, it's damn close. It's damn close. It's one of the greatest cards. I mean, just he looks. I was thinking this when I was preparing for this. I was looking specifically at Ashburn and and Williams, and it's almost like they look like superheroes. I know I'm, I'm getting. Uh, yeah, look at that. It's like it's like one guy is like Batman and the other guy is Superman. I mean, they're just they're great photo or great great images. You know, it, it Ashburn and, and and you know it was a big deal because Philadelphia Gum Bowman. Is, is from Philadelphia. And what we forgot to mention is that the, the largest amount of players in the Bowman, the 50 Bowman set are Phillies. I think there's 19 Phillies in it and there's 19 Tigers. Uh, but the Phillies, they wanted to give them a good showing. And the 1950 was the whiz kid season. Um, and, uh, and they won the world series and uh, you know, it's just, did they win the world series? I thought they did. I don't think so. No. Who, who was it? But it was the whiz kids and Ashburn between Ashburn and uh and Williams, great looking cards, but that Ted Williams, you know, you just that finish again, finishing the swing, the hole in the background, all the, um, the stands in the background. And I believe it might be Fenway. It's Fenway, isn't it? I don't know. Yes, but, it's Fenway. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, it's a great card. And I've been like, again, I've been working on, I, I, I had an offer on a 5.5 the other day and the guy just would not move. So anyway, I do. <laughs> I'm going to switch gears back to condition real quick because as I'm looking at these cards sitting on my desk, it's amazing how good these can look in threes and fours. You know, they these really hold up despite the fact that they're far from, you know, if you can get a lower grade, you're not going to be disappointed with the way that card looks, you know. I would say generally you're right, but I also would caution people to make sure – whatever you like about condition that you, you really look at the card. So there are ones that have snow, um, but you're right. You can find yourself uh, anywhere from a one to a four that looks fantastic. I mean, here's, here's a, this Adobe and it's a four and it's got really good registration and stuff. Now on the back, it has a little bit of uh, I'm showing this. It's got, it's got some marks on the back, not, not marks like a pen mark, just a little bit of, of browning. Anyway, it's, it's, yeah, these cards, I think, you know, if you get a seven of, of a four of a 50 Bowman card, it almost looks fake. If you've ever seen one, I mean, you, you have a high grade on the camp. You have a six, right? Yep. Um, I had a guy come up to me at a show recently and he had just gotten some great grades from PSA and one was a Sam Jethro and the Sam Jethro card was a seven and it just almost looked, it was beautiful. But it it was like wow, this thing was just a blazer. So I think you're absolutely right. You can get lower grades and be completely content with it, especially even the superstars with Jackie, a Ted, a Yogi. They just they look so good. As long as you can get a good front that doesn't have fading and the registration's good, I think you're really good to go. Yeah. All right, I'll ask the question again. How many Jackies do you have? Well, I have four at this point. Um, yeah, I started collecting them, and I've, I've, I bought them raw at certain points and just got them graded um, and got decent grades. And then they used to not be very expensive. You know, I'm going through the – this is 2014 SMR with Jeter on the front. Okay. And, again, Jackie finally eclipsed Ted Williams in 2014, and it's not by much. And back then, according to the SMR, which is always a little bit low – you could pick up a 50 Bowman Jackie in a five for $450. Yeah. 
So that card is 10.5x that now, maybe 10x. Or I'm sorry, not 10x. Yeah. Yeah. 10x. So it's like it's it's gone up a lot. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I actually sold off one and then to get a rookie, and then uh, I traded one to Ken's cardboard <laughs> in a trade. Uh, but anyway, uh, you got yours. You you got one, and you got it raw from a collector uh, out there, and uh, then you subbed it at the National two years ago, right? That's correct. Uh, and I called the grade. I thought it was a two and a half, and it came back a two and a half. Nice. Um, great centering. Uh, not great. Good centering. Great registration, which is all I – that's my biggest thing on any vintage card mm -hmm. is the picture. Uh, I don't care about the corners as much. I – Again, it's like, do I care? Yes. What do I care the most about? The picture. I hate snow. I hate creases through the faces, things like that. But pretty much a lot of other defects I can live with if that top thing is is really good on a card. So, but the Jackie, I, again, I bought it raw, like you said, submitted at the National. Wasn't worried about if it was real. I just hoped it would grade decently and i'm perfectly happy and content with having a two and a half so yeah it's i mean these cards again they're they're beautiful in any grade and like here's a three for example um and this three is it's a really nice three um and yeah, on that yeah it's got um i just bought this one because it was like such a good it was up and it was a good deal and i'm like i can't let this go but um it's got a little bit of wax on the back which is kind of going into what we're talking about where what's going on with the set well it came in five card packs and one card packs so one cent one card pack so it's not uncommon to have wax on the back of these um and it doesn't really take away from it uh, but yeah this uh to me yeah this is to, this to me this is my favorite baseball card i mean there's just like not this this image this whole thing it's it's my favorite baseball card and i can't you know it's it it you know, when you really look at the art on it, and it's a photo by Barney Stein that was taken, who was a Dodgers photographer and worked for the New York Post. And he took um, this photo in 1949 uh, when Jackie was in the midst of his MVP season and uh, one of the higher wars um, at, at, through that time period. So um, I just think it's just a, a great card, you know, again, like like this is his best card to me. Uh, there's a lot of it. I'm, and I'm not getting into the the major issue cards is what I'm referring to, not the uh, bond bread. You know, yeah, the, and there's there's other issues too, but and this still is has some rarity kind of to it. Not, not really rarity, but it's just it's more difficult than the 49 Bowman. There are fewer of them. Uh, it's more difficult than the 49, 48 Leaf. Uh, don't want to offend Dave, <laughs> but anyway. So uh, yeah, it, it's more difficult than those. Uh, the 52 Tops Jackie is more. Uh, is rarer than the 50 Bowman Jackie. But of the main major early issues of his first three issues of major of Bowman and Leaf, th it's the toughest one to get. Um, and, you know, the pop reports on these are also inflated because people, and I've mentioned this before, they, they crack it out and they try to get, hey, I want, this is a five of, of it also. And it's like, they want to get these cards. Like, I want to get this bump to a five and a half, so I resub it. I don't, right. I don't, I don't do that, but... Because I, I know if I resub it, they're going to give it a four. Right. Because <laughs> that's what they do. That but anyway, uh, yeah, these these cards, this is what this is the reason that I got into the whole, um, in, into 50 Bowman. And I've just been picking up cards here and there. Uh, and just, you know, you re recognize the beauty of the set. And uh, just, again, some of the best cards of the players. And another one I haven't picked up, but I've been on, looking for for a long time. The right one is Duke Snyder. Duke Snyder's card is absolutely outstanding in this set. Horizontal, yep. landscape, just a beautiful card. So are you trying to complete the set? Like what? what's on your radar there? Like what are you trying to go after? Just particular Hall of Famers or players you like, or what are you trying to do there? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for the Hall of Famers mostly, but I mean, if I see, if I were to come, if I come across raw ones that are nice, I try to pick them up. Um, they're not here right now, but I try to pick them up. And you know, there's so many of these cards that are just, you know, if you when you see a nice one, you know, right? You're like, wow, that's it, you know, blows your socks off. And so you, know, you try to try to figure out a way to get the card. But yeah, my my radar is basically going to be. It, it's been. I'm trying to get a Yogi. I'm trying to get a Williams. Um, frankly, the Williams is 
I'm, I'm trying to get a higher grade Williams, you know, and it's just people don't want to move. <laughs> and this is the way it is. It but, is. Uh, you know, I, a guy, there was a Newcomb that went off not too long ago and it was autographed by Don Newcomb. And, and, it, and, it, and I just slept on it and it went for like $200. And it was a beautiful autograph. It was already slabbed. And I'm like, wow, somebody just got a smoking deal on, on, a, on a great, great pitcher. Uh, I mean, anyway, those kinds of things, you know, you're just like, man. Uh, but the, the, those are kind of the Yogi, the the Rizzuto, and the uh, Barra. I'm sorry, the, the Williams are, are are on the list right now. So Snyder, I'm Snyder. Snyder too. Yeah, I just get distracted. You know, you have to get distracted by so many things. You, just, you know, we're all collecting so many things. I, it's hard to get like a project and just. I'm not. A, I'm not really a set collector either. Honestly, I mean, I love this set. I love looking at the cards. Like when you find them in binders, and you're looking at them, you're just like amazed at how how beautiful they are. What would you change about the set if you could add something or or take away something? Is there anything that comes to mind quickly on? How would you how you would make it better? Well, we haven't talked about who was left out. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's where I was kind of going with that. So I'm yeah, glad yeah. you up that. I, I got it. <laughs> so I, I think that, uh, and I sent you a picture of a a, a knockoff a guy who I found online had a 50 Bowman Stan Musial, and the way the picture was was beautiful, and I would love to give him credit, uh, but I don't. I'm gonna pull up my phone. And it had a great, nice background, uh, just like you would expect a uh, Stan Musial to have, uh, or I'm sorry, the 50 Bowman to have. But I guess to get to your question directly, yeah, obviously we want Satchel Page in it, and we want Joe DiMaggio in it, and we want Stan Musial in it. And those are the three big omissions. Um, these omissions, though, you know, I, I guess I was digging deeper, and I was trying to figure out something other than which is on like the PSA site and everywhere you go, it says, well, there were, there were contract issues. Yeah. Okay. There were con. Well, why were there contract issues? Why does Stan Musial have a 48 Bowman and a 49 Bowman? It's beautiful. And he doesn't have a 50 Bowman. Why? I don't know. Uh, Joe DiMaggio, I can explain probably, um, well, he never was a Bowman guy, right? He never had a Bowman card. So he had the 49 leaf, 48, 49 leaf. And then, uh, you know, there are other DiMaggio issues coming out of post-war uh, that, you know, uh, Propagandas Montiel, uh, there was the uh, blue he tent. Bur he had blue Bur Burke Ross cards in 51. And then Burke and Ross in 51 and 52. But he was never involved with Bowman uh, in any way. Uh, and so, which is ironic because then Mantle immediately gets involved with Bowman, right? Right when he comes up. So I would love to have a Joe DiMaggio uh which would be beautiful to be paired with the Ted Williams, uh, of course, you know, and then uh, Satchel Page. Satchel Page is not in the set because he was my. I'm theorizing here. Uh, he was released by Cleveland in early 1950, and so at that point, whether I don't know if they had a Satchel Page card on the drawing board or not, but he was not on a roster and he did not play in the major leagues in 1950. The bigger question would for me would be in 1951, he does come back and he plays because Bill Vex signs him and he pitches, I believe, for the St. Louis Browns and he begins his career with the Browns. Now, it's funny because Satch gets uh, cast aside by the Indians because his record was four and seven in 1949, uh, even though his ERA was 3.04. <laughs> so anyway, so that, I think that's why Satchel Page is not in the 50 Bowman set is because he just wasn't playing ball at that point. But the, again, the more the bigger the mis the mystery to me more is Stan Musial. Why is Musial? I know con oh, it's contract. He was under contract. But why 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 was he dissatisfied with Bowman? He had been with them for two seasons, um, and he was the most popular National League player. I mean, I, I'm pretty confident in, in saying that. And he was the best National League player. Right. Uh, one of the three greatest players of his era. Um, and so, wh why is he not in 50 Bowman? Why is he not in 51 Bowman? And then he's in 52 Bowman, and then he holds out with tops until 58, as you know. So, and he's uh, in 53 Bowman color too. Yes, yeah. So, so I don't know, but th that's the that's one of the changes the players, you know, you'd make because, you know, boy, there's those are those are big hitters. At the same time, if you did have those big hitters in the set, it'd be a lot more expensive. I mean, imagine, you know, what would a Satchel Page? 
I mean, it stands undervalued. We all know this. But, but boy, what would a Satchel Page or Joe DiMaggio 50 Bowman go for? Oh, it would be uh, certainly comic cards, you know, several thousand dollars for a decent Yeah, rate. it would be the DiMaggio would go for what the Ted goes for, maybe a little bit extra. And the right. Satchel would probably go in between what the Jackie goes for and the Williams goes for. Right. But we can't reinvent the wheel. But yeah, that that those are the two those that those are the things I would regarding the, the, the omissions. That that's what I would really that's what bothers me about it. But other than that, there's not a whole lot. What about you, Mike? What do you what do you think? Well, I agree with you completely on the omissions. Uh on the design. I would I wish the cards were bigger, honestly, but that was kind of the way it was at that point. Cards hadn't gotten bigger until 1952 tops, right? Um and they were pretty, really big. <laughs> right. And they were really big. So I, I would make the set bigger because I think the pictures would be enhanced even more. You'd be able to see more. Um, but, yeah, I I never understood. You know, it's like every set is missing somebody, right? None of them have everybody like they do now, where the top set's going to have every player pretty much and every player that could even sniff playing in an actual game much less every superstar and you, you know what set had every player in it this is a burke ross hit parade yeah. of champions uh yeah. this is a rapper and uh yeah burke ross in 1952 didn't didn't give a rat's ass they just they just they didn't have dimaggio under contract and they made a dimaggio card right they, didn't care. they had sam usual they had everybody they had bob feller they had uh jackie robinson um you know, they just they didn't care. They just made whatever. They were from New York. I don't know. I don't know. They were just they, they were two and done, 51 and 52. Right. But everybody is in that set. Good point. Most of the major issues, though, you're you're not you're missing somebody, you know. Um, and that's that's, well, that, just, that's the only exception I can think of, honestly. Right. Um, what else do you want to talk about it before I let you go? Any other oh I can keep going. Here? No, but uh, I, you know, I wanted to kind of, I should have done this at the beginning, but, you know, I wanted to say that this set too is the beginning, is the beginning of the golden age of baseball. And I think that it's, it's something we say, we say golden age of baseball, oh, Willie, Mickey and the Duke and New York and this and that. But when you really think about why it is the golden age of baseball, why is it that the 1950s brings us these legends and which will come to well i'll talk about that in a minute but it's because of the infusion of stars from the negro leagues it is the great stars that are already existing the joe dimaggio's the bob fellers the yogi Berra's. those guys are coming up the stan musials and then all of a sudden you have this talent infusion that you've never ever seen in in american sports before or since of the greatest some of the greatest baseball players are it's like you have these two leagues. I mean, I, the only thing I can think of is like ABA and NBA. Right. But you know, we got Dr. J and we got Dan Issel and some other great eight artists, Gilmore, but it wasn't like you were taking, you know, Jackie Robinson and, uh, and Satchel page. And then later on, Willie Mays and Ernie Banks and some of the players that will be known as the inner circle greatest players. And that's what makes up – and then to add them to a young Mickey Mantle coming up, a Stan Musial that's in his prime, Ted Williams, it's like this creates this, this, this golden age of baseball that we're talking about, which is what never happened since then. You know, in the 70s when we were growing up watching Reggie and Carew and Ryan, that was awesome. But it didn't have the same flavor. And it's like – like you hear your, your uncle or somebody talk about it, and you're like, wow, you know, like – Duke Snyder is like not as good as these other guys and Duke Snyder's really good. And right. so I think that's what this, this whole set, you know, the 50 Bowman set kind of kicks off this golden age of baseball. And it's like, you have all these guys that are coming in and it's like, you know, Campanella would win three, the national league is going to integrate. Right. And they're going to eight, eight since 1950 in the 1950s, Eight of the ten players who won the MVP in the National League were African American. Roy Campanella winning three of them, Ernie Banks winning, I believe two. Um, he did back to back. Yeah, back to back in like '58 and '59. But mm -hmm. it's like this is just a talent infusion, and this 
50 Bowman set is kind of like the, the seeds. It's the very beginning of it. So that's why it has a significance, I think, in, in, in the hobby. Uh, and it continues to have significance. And when I read uh, when I read up on what's it worth, in 1983, you could get the whole set for 920 bucks in mint condition. So, you know, it's it's gaining momentum. I, I, all cards are gaining momentum. But I, I think that, like, this is the beginning of the golden age of baseball as we have become have come to know it. And then, you know, it'll hit its apex, in my opinion, in 1958. The 1958 All-Star set, Topps All-Star set, is like the apex of the golden age of baseball. You have this All-Star team on both sides in these baseball cards that's just unbelievable, right? Yeah. And that, to me, is like when it hits kind of from card world, the 1950s golden age hits its apex. But it starts in 1950 Bowman in a lot of ways uh, to me. So I think I just want to touch on that. I didn't get a chance to, to – to mouth off about that earlier. No, I love it. And yeah, you're 100% right on that realization of the talent infusion. You know, it it had trickled, right? But by 1950, it's it's happening. You know, most teams have integrated by that point to some degree. Uh half a league, I guess, by then I think had done it. Mm -hmm. So, you're starting to see the Larry Dobies and the Monty Irvins, the next, you know, Monty Irvin comes in in 1950, right? Or 51 is his first cards. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that's a, that's a great point, which makes it really a significant step for that reason. Right. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, you're, you're thinking about like, well, these guys, I mean, it was Irvin and Hank Thompson and, uh, and Willie Mays, first African American outfield in the 1951 World Series, you know, and they were really good. Um, and I, you know, it's it's funny too, by the way, on this set, there's a great a great card of um, Bobby Thompson, right? And he's swinging the bat, and it's 1950 Bowman Bobby Thompson, and it's ironic that it's such a great. He's not a great hitter, but it's it's this moment, and then a year later he'll hit the shot heard around the world. So I thought that was a really cool element of the 1950 Bowman set that like there's all kinds of different bizarre things about the set that I found out in my research but um you know that would be that'd be another one of them um what Mike what do you what do you think where are you going with this set are you trying to pick up any other cards yeah so I only have six of the 27 hall of famers I want to have them all ultimately uh, it's kind of, again, one of those, like you said, sneaky expensive. So it's been one or two a year that I've been able to just kind of pick up, uh, usually at the national. I bought a few of them last year at the national, the Ashburn that I have, uh, the Pee Wee Reese I bought last year at the national. So just continuing to add to that run. Uh, I need the feller. I, I look for it often, honestly, and it's always a multi hundred dollar card. And it's like, oh, you know, eventually I'll get it. But I just love the the Hall of Famer runs. Um, just and that's one that's my least, the one I had the least cards of is Fifty Bowman, actually. Yeah, I was regretting the fact I have a feller in a three, and I just wish that I had bought a higher grade. Not I mean not that you have to have a higher grade. All cards are beautiful, as Lou Rock says. Right, but. I, I feel like, you know, it's just such a beautiful card that I would like to upgrade it at some point. Um, and I'm just trying to think of any other 50 Bowman oddities. Uh, I had some notes. There was an interesting one about uh, Dick Sisler. He's in the set. And, you know, I was talking about the girders and the beams and the stadiums and everything in the backgrounds and all these. Dick Sisler seems to be the only card uh, where the background looks more like a 41 play ball. Like it's got this art deco background where there's no depth to anything. It's just a, a black like sh shades behind him. You know what I mean? Of, of shapes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I was looking at that and it's like kind of ironic because I uh, did some research on Dick Sisler and he's George Sisler's middle son. Uh, and he was a power hitter and uh, in the, he hit the 10th inning home run in the final game of the 1950 season to give the whiz kid Phillies the National League pennant. Um, at the expense of the Brooklyn Dodgers, uh, who his dad, George Sisler, was a scout for. 
So I thought that was kind of an interesting little note about the about the set and about Dick Sisler because as I was looking through all the cards and I was recalling the cards, it was the only one I it didn't seem it seemed to stand out because it didn't seem to go with the rest. You know what I mean? Because it looked more to the, the foreground picture of him hitting is is fine, but then the background looked like a forty one play ball card. Interesting. Well, man, I hope you had a lot of fun doing some homework, getting ready for this episode. I'm so glad you were willing to come on and talk about this wonderful awesome set so uh if you guys have any questions about it leave them down below in the youtube video shoot me a uh direct message on instagram if you want to reach out my instagram handle is baseball collector mike george what's yours so people if they want to reach out ask <laughs> questions or i can just give my email it's uh, at az diamond yard at gmail.com uh, you can reach out to me there uh, or hit my channel at diamond yard sports cards Awesome. Mike, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. Um, I feel like we could just keep going, but uh, time is uh, time is not our friend. So uh, thank you again. Appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you, everybody out there, for watching. Thanks for listening. As always, we'll catch you next week for another Bowman set. Stay tuned for which one it'll be. Talk to you guys soon. Keep collecting.